You're listening to Run, Are You Win? Revive Us Now podcast with Steve Gray. As pastor of the Smithton Outpouring and the Kansas City Revival, Steve is a leading voice of revival worldwide. Steve shares his life-changing encounters with God, along with biblical teaching that equips you to experience and lead lasting revival. Come, run with Steve and expect God to revive us now. Hello and welcome to Revive Us Now podcast. We're going to run together. I'm your host, Steve Gray, and I am so glad you decided to RU in run with me today for revival. We need revival in America, but we need revival in our churches. We need it in our homes. We need it in our marriages. Some people need it in their finances. Some people just need the reviving power of God in their hearts and emotions. So we're going to believe for that and talk about everything we can on these podcasts about revival. And today we're going to talk about how to get the glory and power and God back, specifically in our churches, but we're going to also talk about individually too, because there's a, there are ways to make it happen. There are reasons why we're not experiencing the glory and power of God like we should. And uh, maybe it's just me, but sometimes I think about that of all the Christian phrases we say that, you know, God, uh, Jesus is in my heart and God is in the house and 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 all those phrases and then but if you think about it how that sounds to somebody else that maybe doesn't even know God to say you know I've got I've got the the king of kings and the lord of lords inside of me but there's no evidence there's not you know you don't see any manifestation of him being there you're just as ordinary as anybody else without anything happening or you say God's in our church and then there's no evidence of God in the church and I'm just wanting to stretch that a little bit without being critical, thinking about, really? You know, I really think if God starts attending, empowering, we're going to know it. If God really starts moving by his spirit in us individually, we're going to know it. And, uh, and I think that's what people are hungry for. And I think those that don't go to church, they're hungry to, to experience God. You're going to find out there's very few people that would not like God to talk to them. Very few people, you know, you ask people, would you like God, would, would you like God to just tell you something? Would you like to hear God talk to you and tell you some things? People go, yeah, I would like to hear from God. And so, so it's not that they're really anti-God. It's something that's going on in the church that is a little empty. You know, it's empty and it's not flourishing to the fullness of the glory and power of God. And so that's our goal as a church is to get the glory and power of God back in the church so that unbelievers and non-believers be- begin to really experience the presence and power of God, which is life-changing, really experience the life of Jesus. And, of course, then we as believers, it's got to start with us. We've got to have it ourselves so that we can share it with other, <coughs> with other people. So here we go. Uh, I, in fact, I was looking through my book, When the Kingdom Comes, and uh, saw this chapter, and it's called God's House in Ruins. I'm calling it today, we're getting God's glory back in our churches. And so for, I, I began to, to take apart in my book, uh, I began to take apart the book of Haggai. It's kind of an odd word, kind of a hard one to say Haggai. But anyway, in chapter one, Haggai, we begin to understand how do, how, how do we get it, and why is it that we're, we're in a spiritual drought, so many churches are, <clears throat> Why is it that we read about the blessings of God, the prosperity of God, all the God things we read about in the Bible, but then when we look, we go to church or just in our homes or whatever, we don't see it. We don't see much of it and a lot of talk about it, but not much of it. Well, I want to help you understand it. So chapter one of the verse, uh, the book of Haggai uh, starts out and it says, this is what the people are saying. It is not time for us to rebuild the Lord's house. Now, these are people coming back from exile, and they, they, they've been in exile. Now they're coming back. Uh, they've been in 70 years in Babylon, and now they're back. And the temple, out of all these years, is in ruins. It looks bad. It's torn down. It's not operating well. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, they say, but you know what? It's, it's not time. It's not time to, to do anything. And I, I know from my own experience, you know, I, I preach, I teach, I talk about a move of God, the, a visitation from God, revival, refreshing, you know, all these words, you know, 
renewal that God wants to do in our lives. And then you talk to people, they are pastors, leaders, churches, and they go, well, you know, that's good for your church, but I just don't think it's time for our church. And I'm, I had that said many times. Our church is just not ready or uh, it's just not time. Well, that's what happened here. So God's house is completely torn down. It's in ruins. And they said, well, you know, we just don't think it's time to build God's house yet. Now, here's the problem that bothered God, though. In, in that region of the country at that time, there was only so much wood to go around. It's not, you know, they didn't have the forest like we have in our country. And so what they did when they came back from exile, they went and got all the wood that they could get. And they built their own houses. So now their houses are built and they got all fixed up. And because, you know, there was a lot of destruction when they left and they fixed them all up. But they never got around to fixing God's house. Now, there's a reason for that, because they thought to them, at least I think they thought to themselves, well, you know, there's only so much wood. If we use it on God's house, there won't be enough for us. Oh, man, does that get people or what? You know, like. Here comes offering time, and the pastor, leader, whatever, says, all right, let's give an offering. And you think, well, you know, if I give to God, there won't be enough for me. But, see, that's not scriptural. Giving to God produces. And so here they're making that big mistake. They're saying, you know, uh, and so and we fix up our own houses because there's only so much wood. So God mentions it to them. And uh, he said, when they said it's not time to build God's house, God asked him a question. He says, well, you know, do you think it's time that you built your houses? You thought it was time to build yours, but you didn't think it was time to build mine and leave mine in ruins. And so that's the situation they were in. And then get this. I mean, this is major understanding. Then God says, when you made that mistake and built your own houses and neglected my house, then this is what you got. And he says, think about what you're doing. He said, you planted a lot. I saw you plant, but you know what? Your harvest was little and you eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you're still thirsty. Your clothes wear out. You, you earn money. You got wages, but it's just as though there's a hole in your purse. You ever felt like that? I'm going to work, I'm going to work, I'm going to work. But it's, where's the money go? <laughs> See, in God's kingdom, we're supposed to say, I can't understand where it comes from. But in the world kingdom, right, it's like, I don't understand where it goes. Where's the money go? Well, that's what was happening to them. In other words, the symptoms were their dissatisfaction. They weren't prospering. They were doing everything. They were planting, but not getting the harvest. And they had wages, but where's it go? I, it, we're not being blessed here, basically. You know, and, and we're thirst, we, we drink, but we're still thirsty. We eat, we're still hungry. It's just there's emptiness on us. What's going on? And God says, well, those are all symptoms of neglecting God's house. And it's easy to do. You know, you think, I got to take care of myself, let God take care of himself. But that's not how it works. He says, you need, what you need to do, you need, he tells them, you need to go up into mountains, get some timber, and come down and start working on my house. Start working on my house. Get my house fixed up. Get it where it needs to be. Get God's house. Take care of God's house first. Take care of God's things first. You've heard it. Seek the kingdom of God first. Return to your first love. Tithing is first fruits. And so God says, come on, I got to be put first again because my house is in ruin while all your houses look great and that's not going to go. And then get this. Says, so here's what God says. He says, therefore, I have withheld the dew or the rain. I've been withholding it. You think there's, you know, don't have enough rain. You think, hey, you know, we're kind of living in a drought here. On your crops, he says, you know what? That was me all along. And that kind of goes against our theo theology of blessing, or does it? Because the end result is God wants to bless them, but he wants to bless them beyond where they are because neglecting God doesn't produce the blessing. And so he says, well, I'm going to make it tougher on you. So he says, I withhold it. I'm withholding. I'm pulling everything back so that you'll be able to have a place of reasoning so God can reason with us and say, look, this is why it's happening to you. So if you just change that, if you just start putting my house first, give God a special place in your life, in your heart, you know, just start having regard for God, start having interest in God, start thinking about what 
is interested. What, what's God up to? What's he interested in? What's he want to do? And uh, he said, so if you'll just start putting some energy and time and money and put it back in my kingdom and in my house, then you'll find I'll open the heavens and the rain will come and the dew will come and the, and every, the oil will flow and the ground will produce all the symptoms you have. We don't have enough. We're running out. There's a hole in our purse. He says, those are all symptoms of neglecting the things of God and only taking care of yourself. So powerful. If you want to get God's glory back in your church, you start putting him at the top of the list. And you just talk to your family, talk to your kids. If you can't get your church to do it, can't get a pastor or leader to do it, or whoever you are, talk to your own family and say, look, we want to increase the blessing on our house. We go from paycheck to paycheck. We, we, we sow but, and, and we earn money, but there's not enough. We don't seem to have enough. And uh, we seem to always run out. And you say, but you know what, family? What would happen if we would follow this pattern and give God a priority place in our life? What would happen if we'd start really putting the kingdom of God first? And God says, then I'll start sending it. The blessings will start coming. So he says, let's stop neglecting my house. You've fixed your house. Now put your time and your energy back into my house. Well, that's the lesson. That's what they say is going to work. That's going to work. Now, here's another most amazing thing that took place. They listened. <laughs> they agreed. This says, you know, the, the spirit of Zerubbabel, the leader, you know. And so the prophet says this and they hear about it. And all of a sudden they get all stirred up and they said, you know what? This is right. They're right. We could do this. And that just amazes me. It amazes me because how many people are running out? How many people are struggling? How many churches? And if we put it in the spirit realm, too, just like, you know, water is a spiritual term, you know, wine and water and rivers and fire. All those are spiritual terms in the Bible that God, you know, comes in fire. He comes with a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And there is a river of life flowing out of me. So all these water things, and God says, I'm withholding because you're, you're, you don't have a priority. I'm not important to you. You're taking care of yourself. You're not taking care of the kingdom of God. So he says, you know, you want to turn that around. The prophet says, turn that around. Go up into the mountains and get timber and come down and start to work on my stuff, on my kingdom. So you can do it as a family. Well, you can do it as your individual. Say, individual, this is me. This, he's talking about me. Or your family. Family, we're going to set a higher priority. We're, uh, you know, maybe you're not godless, but he's not got a priority. He's not in center, front and center. Or a church. And you see a church and they got all kinds of programs and they've got support groups and they got, and those are all good, but the focus is still on the people, you know, and you ever notice sometimes churches and pastors and leaders and sermons just talk to us like we're losers and we're broken down. They automatically assume you're broken down. Uh, you're struggling with love that God loves you. You're struggling with forgiveness. You don't feel forgiven. You don't feel loved. And, and you don't feel important, you're low self, you know, and they talk to you like, okay, I'm going to help you keep going. But what if we just stop talking like we're losers instead of talk and start talking like we're builders, like we can do something like you don't have to just hang on. You can do something. Let's build the kingdom of God. Let's get God's timber and come and build God's house. Let's start doing God things. Let's start getting prayer back, uh, back in our churches. Get prayer back in our churches. I heard the other day somebody was talking about getting prayer back in our schools. Well, uh, we need to get it back in our churches. You know, you if you hold a big dinner, everybody comes. You hold a prayer meeting, you can't get anybody to show up. Let's get prayer back in our churches. Let's get priority. Let's get worship. Let's stop looking at our watches on Sunday morning like we've got something better to do. How does that make God feel? Like, when's this going to get over? Well, because I got to get back to my super paneled house that I fixed up really nice because I got a nice rec room and I can watch the game. How does that make God feel? And so we got to get back to priority and say, you know what? 
I got a good life and I got stuff, but I keep running out. I don't have enough. I, I'm empty on the inside. Not just material-wise. He's talking about material things. But I'm empty on the inside. I want the glory. I want to experience his power. I want to be filled with the Spirit and know that reviving power of God that so many people have expressed. And you can read about it and it changed their lives forever. You know that power Paul's on the road to Damascus. He's named Saul and he's going to persecute Christians and throw them in prison. Bang! Suddenly the presence of God comes. He's knocked to the ground and he gets up and he's another person. Wouldn't you like something like that? I want to become somebody else. If you don't like who you are, let God make you into somebody else. He can do it. So God stirred up the remnant of the people and they said, well, let's do it. Let's start building God's house. Let's start doing it. And then God says a promise to him. And he says, you know what? You're on your way now. And the glory that you experienced before is nothing to what's coming. Wouldn't that be a great word? Now, we do hear words like that. I hear prophets saying, like, what's coming is going to be so great. But I think we need to, not, we need to understand there's a big if. If my people, you know, will humble themselves and pray. If we turn, and we're going to have to have a priority. God's not going to show up in power and glory and majesty to a people who don't care. We got to care. We got to want. We got to want to be those people. So, so uh, now we, we need to begin to believe the great glory of God. It can come. It can come to your church. All we have to do is set God higher up. Get a greater priority of him. Set the love of God. We got to love God with all our hearts. You know, I know I've sh shaken up some religious minds through past years by saying, you know, it seems like we're starting at the wrong place with our family and our kids. Because with me, and maybe with you, take me to church as a little kid, and the first thing they want me to know is what? God loves me. Okay, Jesus loves me. I'm singing Jesus loves me this Sunday. Okay, we need to know that. But that's not where God started. <laughs> no, see, God started with teach people to love me. Thou shalt love God. And it was a commandment. You've got to love God. Why? Because that teaches us love, real love. And we start flowing out of that. Now is when we learn the love of God and we start loving God. So I just thought about that. I said, what would happen to a whole church and society if when kids start going to church, the first thing they learn is how to love back, how to love God, how to express love rather than just sit there. Okay, somebody make me feel loved. So it's another subject. Maybe I shouldn't have started it, but it is something you can think about. Think about how that would revolutionize our lives if we started doing God's way, which he said, love me. Love me first. Start with me. Start learning to love me. And so we start doing that. We start reading our Bible. We read our Bible at home. We start believing the word. We start when the, if you're not the pastor and you're not preaching, when you're sitting there in the pew, what do you do? Man, you just zone into that word of God. Try to hear every word. Try to not let distractions come. This is too important. This is the most, most important hour of my week is being here at church in the presence of God, here in the word of God, worshiping with the saints. And you just up it all. You just up everything to where there's a priority. And that's when revival starts. You see, when people start loving God with all their heart, revival has begun. Now, it may have a long way to go. We may not be very good at it, but God will begin to honor that and the glory of God when we put a priority on God. So that's all it is. It's that simple. It's changing our priorities. It's not all about us anymore. It's not all about you. It's not about how you feel. You know, uh, sometimes people come in, you know, they want the church to just wrap around all their feelings, you know. And, uh, you know, you say, well, let's worship God. And somebody might say, well, I don't feel like it well, we're not here for your feelings. We're here for his. <laughs> so we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it because he wants it. We're here to make him feel the way he needs to feel. So the point being is this. It's time to build God's house. It's time to put a priority on it. Now, you may already have a beautiful church building. You might already have a beautiful church house. And, and you might have a personal house. So now let's step over and into the spirit realm with me and notice what Jesus and, and Paul said. You know, he said, do you, do you know that you are, you are the house of God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, if you're the house, now you look at yourself. Have you neglected God's house? If you're the temple, how much do you put into it? Are you, all, are, you, are you all about yourself, all about your job, all about entertainment, all about movies, and you just neglect God? You neglect prayer. You neglect going to church maybe now. You, you neglect worship. You, you just neglect a mind on God. You just neglect thinking about God. You just don't really care that much what God thinks. You know, all these things. Putting a priority. And, you know, uh, wickedness is not having any regard for God. It's when people lose their interest. and They just don't care. They don't care about God. And so we want to get back to a heart of God. Now, so when we say neglecting God's house, you want to get the glory back? Build God's house. We're not talking about a building now, are we, made with hands. We're talking about the people of God. We need to be rebuilt. And when you do that, if you'll start rebuilding your heart on God, rebuilding your prayer life, rebuilding, just rebuilding your interest in God, and talk about it with your families, I'm going to guarantee you, God is going to change everything. God said he would right here now. He said, you do this, and I am going to increase and the glory that you heard about in the past, it won't compare to the glory that's coming in your future. This is a good lesson. Good lesson. And you know what? It's not that hard. And it's what we should be doing all along. And now we need to do it again. It's time to build God's house for you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that these words will pierce through. It'll just wake some people up, a pastor, a leader, a family, a mom, a dad, a teenager, that they'll hear this and go, I can do this. This really makes sense. I can do this. Open their eyes, open their eyes, open their heart to understanding in the name of Jesus. And so we're so glad we could be together today and talk about revival. Oh, that God would rend the heavens and come down in power and glory and revive us once again. America needs revival. The church needs revival. I need revival. You need revival. So let's run together for revival. Until next time, bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Revive Us Now podcast with Steve Gray. Push the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode and spread the word on social media. For more episodes and resources, go to reviveusnowpodcast.com. Until next time, keep on running for revival.